are embryos considered people? Is IVF still safe? What do you need to know about fetal personhood and what that means? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. So I'm a fertility doctor and I talk about IVF and embryos every single day. And as you know, if you've been following the news, there was the recent case that came out of Alabama in which embryos were declared children. And a lot of people didn't understand why this was bad. And if you're trying to help people get pregnant, why that could actually make it harder to do IVF. So really quickly, I want to break down the IVF process but answer a few tough questions that you're having because this is so essential to understand. Because on the surface, a lot of people who might be trying to advocate for something may have an intention or a motive that's different than what they state, or just they're preying off the fact that reproductive health is not very well discussed and that there's a lot of stigma. People used to do IVF and never tell a friend, and people still do that. There are people who go through the process and feel so stigmatized by it that they don't ever want to talk about it. The problem then, if we don't talk about things and we don't understand them, is we're not able to make educated choices. The reality is when we do IVF, what we're trying to do is get one month's group of eggs all to grow. And what's very interesting is that every month you're actually losing a large number of eggs. So you have eggs that come out of the vault inside your ovary every single month. The number of eggs that are released from the vault, it's proportional to how old you are and how many eggs you have left. The best way to think about it is that you're born and your vault is full, and every month you have eggs come out of the vault, and when the vault's empty, you're in menopause. So you're always fighting against this clock of having less eggs over time, but the eggs inside the vault, they also decrease in genetic normalcy, meaning the chromosomes move around and they move spots over time. But let's say you're 30, you would have on average 20 eggs come out of the vault. One of them would ovulate, 19 would die and the next month you have another group come out of the vault. And this process is happening every month, all the time, no matter what. Before you start your period, while you're pregnant, while you're on birth control, until you run out of eggs, you are losing some every month. So we're trying to say, hey, this month, can I get this group of eggs all to grow forward and then take them out of the body? Then I can fertilize them with sperm, and that can either be just in a dish or you can inject a sperm inside each egg that's called ICSI and can be so helpful for certain types of infertility. And from fertilization, these are then embryos. And then embryos go through different stages of development. So of the eggs you get, you're often not going to get 100% of them mature. Not every egg can be fertilized by sperm. So about 90% of the eggs, if you have a really good cycle, will be mature. So let's say of those 20 eggs, 18 of them were mature. You're then going to go fertilize them with sperm, and we're lucky if about 75 to 80 percent fertilized. So let's say 14 fertilized. From the 14, only about half of them will actually get to the implantation stage of embryo. You may not know that in the body, egg and sperm meet in the fallopian tube, and that embryo grows and develops over the course of the next five to six days, going from a single cell into a ball of cells. It's about 300 cells called a blastocyst. And you can see this picture as an expanded outer cavity of cells. This outer surface you see is the trophectoderm, what becomes the placenta, and an inner cell mass, which becomes the baby. This implants into the uterine wall. And so for five or six days, it is actually developing in the fallopian tube. And most embryos do not implant. And that's why natural conception rates are really, really low, right? Your highest chance of getting pregnant when you ovulate and you're young is going to be about 25% per month if you're near 20s. If you're 30, it's about 20% per month. If you're 35, it's 12%. If you're 40, it's 5%. So the chance of getting pregnant per month naturally decreases largely because more of your eggs are genetically abnormal. But we have just natural loss. So of those 14 that fertilized in our example, only about half of them, so seven, would even make it to this blastocyst stage of embryo that we're talking about. At this stage, embryos can be transferred back into the body, but they can also be frozen and they can be sampled. The placenta can be sampled for genetic testing. This number that's going to be genetically normal, and we're just checking to see does an embryo have the right number of chromosomes. There's no way to check to see if it's going to be 
an athlete or tall or have blue eyes. Like that, that's not what we do. It's about, do you have the normal number of chromosomes or are you missing chromosomes that are essential? Therefore, you are not going to implant or are going to miscarry. And the number that's going to be normal is dependent on your age. So a 30-year-old should have a good number, like 60 to 70% normal. A 35-year-old would probably have about half normal. A 40-year-old is probably going to be more like 25% normal. And so if I send off seven embryos for testing, then we're only going to have about four probably that are suitable to even transfer at some point. Those embryos though are frozen and they're waiting until we get the results. Therefore, we can take an embryo with the best potential and put that one inside, improve the chance of success and decrease the risk of complications. Success rates though, even when I put in that one genetically normal embryo, it's only gonna be about 65% per embryo. That's not 100%. That means the average person is going to need two normal embryos to even get to a baby. And what about the abnormal embryos? Especially as we get older and so many of our embryos are genetically abnormal, not spending time transferring embryos, not going through unnecessary loss, leads us to be able to do more egg retrievals and find enough actual embryos to test to find that normal one. Just today, I saw a patient, we finally found a normal embryo after doing four egg retrievals because she's over age 40 and she has a lower egg count than average for her age. And that's the reality for most patients. So if we say that embryos are people or their children, it leads into question, can you freeze them? Can you biopsy them? Can you create them? Can you transfer them? Do you have to transfer all embryos that are created? Do you have to limit the number that are fertilized? And these aren't hypothetical thought experiments because in Italy in 2004, there was a law passed called Law 40, and this actually restricted the number of eggs that you could fertilize and you had to transfer them all. So you can only fertilize, I think it was three, and then they grew out and you had to transfer them all without genetic testing could no longer do genetic testing. And ultimately, this means you're purposely putting certain patients at risk for high order multiples. You're putting people at risk for ovarian hyperstimulation because not doing an embryo transfer and freezing those embryos is one of the ways we help you stay safe and not get sick. There's also single gene disorders like the BRCA gene or cystic fibrosis or Huntington's that we can prevent you from having a child with a severe or even a lethal abnormality. There are things you may not have heard of like bardet Bidel or Pearson syndrome that can be so devastating and families often come to us after they've had a child die and they don't wanna go through that again. And we can help prevent that experience by finding a healthy embryo that's not going to be affected with the disease. IVF is life-changing for people who have cancer. We're able to go through and freeze eggs and embryos before you go through chemotherapy because going through chemotherapy may result in you being in menopause afterward. It also allows us to overcome so many different types of infertility. We see patients come to us in all these scenarios, and it's so easy to say, I would never do that, or I don't need that, or I don't believe in it. And honestly, if you tell me, it's really hard for you to envision having leftover embryos in a freezer. We're gonna discuss, do we wanna transfer all of the embryos we create at some point in your life? Or do we not ever feel comfortable freezing them? And should we be in a position to limit the number we fertilized like they might have done in Italy under Law 40? But that should not mean that because you believe this, it gets applied to everybody and that we roll our technology back to be less successful and more risky. Ultimately, that's going to make IVF less accessible. If embryos are people, what we saw was companies don't want to ship them. Clinics don't want to thaw them or freeze them. It is going to limit access to care. And the liability to even practice in that type of environment is going to be so prohibitive that it will hurt patients the absolute most. Ultimately, this is why understanding your reproductive health, what IVF is and what it isn't, how we modify it for you based on your own beliefs and desires is so important. And more than anything, using your own voice to help share your stories, share this video, share the importance of voting for the issues that matter to you. Please subscribe and follow along. You can also learn more on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or the As a Woman podcast. Thanks, friends.